uh, yeah, let's let's maybe take three questions. So one uh, for those who haven't heard was about soil soil protection. How might that be affected by uh, Brexit? We're seeing a lot. Like we're seeing a move on paper to a completely different agricultural policy in the UK now. Kind of at the at the white paper stage, it looks very different. At the agricultural bill stage, it looks quite like not that different. But movement for you know public money um, for public goods um, and soil has definitely been brought up. Um, again, a bit bittersweet because the UK has been blocking soil the soil directive at the EU. It's now saying thanks to Brexit, we can finally do something about soils. Uh, but it is it appears to be going up the agenda, especially in terms of. The finding some ways of paying farmers and land managers to protect soil. Um, so it's one of these issues that is coming up. But whether that will stay, I mean, we're still at very early stage in devising future agricultural policy. And it's definitely on the agricultural side, much more than the broader soil questions. Can I, can I just yeah. pitch in on, on soil? Because, uh, uh, so just... The, uh, the soil directive, so the attempt of the EU to legislate on protection of soil was killed by a blocking minority of five countries, one of which was the UK. And it's interesting that in debates now on the EU biodiversity strategy, one thing that is resurfacing is the idea of legislating on soil. And I think one of the reasons why it's coming to the debate is because one of the five is mm -hmm. out of the room. So if everybody votes as they voted eight years ago, which is unlikely, uh, you know, today uh, it would pass. So, um, so that's one thing that is, uh, is interesting. Uh, in terms of how will the post-CAP look in the UK, I think that's one to watch because um, this is probably one of the very few things in which the UK can actually go its own way big time without a complete mm -hmm. breakdown of trade and extreme scenarios and so on. Uh, and it's certainly the one area where it's kind of clear what the UK government wants to do and where on paper it's kind of very progressive. Personally, I remain, I remain extremely skeptical because the reality is that almost everything the UK says it wants to do now that it's unshackled, they could have done under the current CAP. So if, if they really believe in what they say, why haven't they done it until now? But they might because uh, they will have nobody to hide behind. Until now, it was very comfortable to say we would want to pay only for public goods. Ah, but the stupid CAP forces us to pay the rich landowners and our friends. Now, you know, the smoke screen is is out, and if you want to keep pumping the money into the same pockets, you, the minister, will need to explain to public opinion why you are taking the decision, and that might change the political economy in a way. So, just in that one. Yeah. Back to you on the other two questions on state so, aid aviation yeah. and... Uh, so on Flybe, um, so it's a tough one, Flybe, because, uh, so, I mean, Northern Ireland, without Flybe, it's very hard to get to most places in the UK. Um, and so it's like, in terms of linking Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK, so there's like, you know, having a government that has fought to not have a uh, border in the Irish Sea and then you remove Flybe, that you kind of have your border in the Irish Sea. So that's why there's lots of political pressure. I mean, yes, there's people in Exeter as well want to go to London, but for the Northern Ireland case, that's uh, it really is important, especially because we've had a big cut into rail and sail. So it's much harder to now go by, you know, ferry plus train to the rest of the UK uh, since January. So if you remove rail and sail and you remove most of the flights, it's get a bit tricky. Um, so that's why there's a lot of political pressure, especially because this is happening as well with just the government coming back in Stormont. So hence, even more pressure. Now, there is, um, if you ask people in Northern Ireland, they say, you know, air passenger duty is actually higher in, in Northern Ireland than it is in Ireland. And this is why lots of people are flying from Dublin. So. I would, that's something that, again, whether it's still the case, that's, that's a usual line on the problem with the, all the airports in Northern Ireland is that we have higher air passenger duty and then we should slash it to be 
for that level playing field uh, with, with Dublin. Now, of course, that goes really against most of the climate commitments uh, of the UK government. But the message from now from Matt Hancock and other is like, you know, we, people should keep on flying. It's really important for the connection in the country and the airport, like, yeah, flying has decarbonized and is decarbonizing more. It's, uh, it's a tough one because it's, you know, it's a country divided on two islands and you do need some connectivity. But whether, you know, how you then um, provide that connectivity is, you know, it's, it's very difficult. But that's, that's not, I can't really, I'm not an expert definitely in air passenger duty. Um, in terms of setting standard and adhering to it, I think that's where, I mean, if we are teaching environmental law in general, we say at least in the, like, the big difference between EU law and international law is that it's got a bite. You know, you can, it's very rare, but you can, you can get a very big fine at the end. Um, and that's something that is very, that, that's something that we're going to lose in the UK, definitely. Because there's problems with, you know, who would you, like, you know, you take money from one government to give back to one government, right? It would be, you know, one department paying the courts and that money would go to another to the treasury. So it's it, because of that kind of system, it would be very difficult to have fines, apparently. That's that's a key argument being used. Um, it's going to be much harder um, to adhere, I think, to, there's going to be less pressure and adhering, but we're seeing still on this note, there's been a big, big <coughs> move uh, from UK politicians because at the start um, we had Andrew Letts when we had still Andrew Letts as a DEFRA secretary so before the 2017 election the position was there is no need to replace the commission of the court of justice we have judicial review that's perfectly fine and we've got parliamentary oversight so you know people like MPs will just you know call out the government if they're doing wrong on the environment and that will be enough you know we'll have parliamentary oversight so they, they moved from this position to agree there's a governance gap and to come up with proposal for it. Now the problem is for now that Office of Environmental Protection applies to England and potentially to Northern Ireland if the Northern Ireland minister asks for it. Now our Northern Ireland minister, very newly appointed, uh, was a creationist at one point, uh, whether he's still, I'm, I'm not sure, um, and is definitely part of a you know, party that has climate skeptics in it. So, so whether they will ask for that, um, and we don't know yet whether Scotland and Wales are going to put, just give more power to existing regulators or create new regulators, mm -hmm. and how the four or three regulators are going to work together or not is very, very unclear. But to end on a very positive note, or very worrying perhaps, um, we're talking about replacing the Court of Justice and the Commission for the Environment perspective. Oh. But no one really in the UK has realized perhaps that these are not environmental <laughs> institutions, right? The role of the Commission and the Court of Justice goes beyond the environment. The whole but common market. Uh, yeah, yeah, again, we're back to the fact that they don't understand the, single, the concept of single market. But So we're g the environment is actually going to be okay compared to all the other policy areas where there's not going to be any commission, where there's not going to be any court of justice. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> which, which, which opens all sorts of, you know, what happens the day that uh, the Scottish government uh, starts dishing out state aid to gin distilleries and uh, the London ones go ballistic and, uh, you know, where, where do you sort that out? Um, one thing I think it's worth to throw in is that there is a little natural experiment, um, natural experiment in more than one sense, um, about the power of EU law versus the power of uh, international agreements um, uh, and it's in biodiversity. So to take a, a really uh, obvious example is wolves. Mm -hmm. Wolves are protected exactly in the same way by the Berne Convention and by the EU Habitats Directive. Um, wolves are going through the roof. Uh, they are recovering, admittedly, from being near extinct everywhere. So going through the roof, uh, <laughs> they are still very rare and endangered. But, um, but they are coming back big time across Europe. 
I mean, they fished one out of the canal a couple of months ago in the center of Milan to yeah. give you an idea of how the comeback is happening. Um, except in Norway and in Switzerland, where they are still uh, being basically shot the moment they cross the border systematically and there's a handful of them that are struggling to get beyond the kind of one or two packs. Um, the difference is the ECJ. Mm -hmm. uh, when Norway decides to exterminate uh, a third or half of their 20 or 40 wolves population, they just get on with it and do it. Mm -hmm. When Sweden tries to open a, a hunting season on wolves, they get taken to the ECJ and, uh, and, and then they need to uh, fall back uh, in line. So this is, uh, and you can see it on a number of other species and, and so on. So the issue of the enforceability of the rules, the fact that you have signed up to rules, whether with yourself or with some uh, multilateral body, uh, whether those rules have a policeman behind them makes a hell of a difference uh, in, in, in the real world mm -hmm. and makes the difference in the case of biodiversity between species going extinct and species recovering. So it's all very real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So role of NGOs, can the NGOs replace the commission? Um, as an NGO where uh, if we swap salaries with commission officials, <laughs> I'm all for it. Uh, uh, and then uh, ETS yeah. and yeah. other... Um, I think the role of the NGOs, um, they don't have the authority, right? So in terms of gathering information and making a strong case, yes. But, you know, the NGOs can't actually then, I mean, especially like in the UK context, charity legislation is very tough. Um, it's very difficult for charities in the UK to take, like to attack the government publicly. Um, they like, ex like get really a lot of pushback against it. So on some cases they can and do it, but um, especially in terms of, in terms of election, it's very difficult for them to do it. Now, Potentially, we are not going to have election now for five years. But for the last few years, I had to be very careful because at any time, an election could be called, and then action for the next, the few months before, would be looked at on whether you tried to influence an election you didn't know was going to happen. So it was very, very difficult actually to take any kind of big action. And we're back to Bowers Convention, the lack of money of the NGOs. Now, I mean. UK environmental NGO is like strongest NGOs in Europe. It's like 8 million members. They're working very well together on Brexit with Greener UK. They've really managed to like build a coalition. They were doing much better than the rest of the charity sector during the referendum, but still didn't manage to have much of an influence. But after, you know, if some NGOs can have a big role in enforcement, it will be them. But it's still very hard. I mean, there's no way I don't, you know, because you don't have the authority. Mm. Um, on the ETS and things, I think in general, the I'd say the public message in the UK has been it's not proper Brexit unless you leave everything that has European in the name. No, well, you know, there's you know, remaining in the single market while other non-EU member states are in the single market. That's not a proper Brexit. Remaining in customs union, that's not a proper Brexit. Um, so it depends on whether that gets that. That's not a proper Brexit treatment. Um, s similar questions with Erasmus, for example. Uh, it's a big question on whether, you know, <coughs> it's, whether it's tainted by its association uh, with the European Union or not. Um, yeah. I mean, on that, it's interesting to see which issues become politicised and which things become labelled European. Because there have been numerous situations whereby people in the UK have said, well, um, the EU wouldn't do that to us, would they? Uh, in the example of, say, medicines or whatever it may be, whereby if it's advantageous, um, then uh, it's no longer necessarily European anymore. Uh, or, and so you, Erasmus, the exchange programme, could, could well be an example of that. And so this is where it gets really interesting in terms of the next 12 months, because mm -hmm. how do certain issues get politicised and labelled could well shape the way in which uh, policy and legislation is adopted mm -hmm immediately after this, this critical juncture for the UK. 
Uh, and on that point, and linked to NGOs, I mean, as you mentioned, NGOs are uh, very popular in the UK, I mean, the 8 million members, as you were saying. Um, but there's obviously different types of NGOs. And um, if you look at the electoral map of the UK during the general election, you'll see it's very blue uh, in the south of England, uh, outside of cities. This is the countryside. This is where a lot of Conservative people who voted for the Conservative Party because they wanted Brexit, but would also very much see themselves as environmentalists who support the local environment. We're not necessarily talking about climate change here, but animal protection, for example, uh, would be a key identity dimension. Uh, and so we were saying earlier about why does the UK want to champion the environment now when it could have gone beyond the standards earlier? Well, the environment is actually a very useful case for the Conservatives to champion now um, because they lost a lot of ground when it came to fracking previously because quite a lot of fracking sites in the UK are actually in Conservative heartlands. And so now we have a new situation whereby uh, people who wanted Brexit in the Conservative seats, and we know that because they're both the Conservatives, say, when many of the other parties were not championing, championing Brexit, uh, those um, voters can now have their confidence in local environmental issues shored up. Green and pleasant lands of England, the countryside, animals, and that understanding of environmental protection can be really pushed forward here, uh, which ties to the NGOs dimension, because so many people are part of NGOs who also voted for Brexit and want local environmental protection to be champions. I think maybe to add on, so on the issue of the NGOs, I mean, apart from the obvious one that, yes, I mean, we can gather information and take it to the Commission, we'll be gathering information in the UK, but where do we take it, which is the obvious one. But I think it's worth thinking about some of the other implications. Um, the Commission enforcement machinery uh, has um, something uh, remarkably democratic about it. Um, you don't need to be bird life that is well structured and has uh, in-house legal competencies and a bit network and a name and so on. I mean, you know, any small one village NGO can file a complaint and get a hearing. Now, obviously, I mean, the reason why I think you should be members of uh, bird life partners is because if you are structured, you know what you do, you can do it better. But there is something fundamentally democratic about the fact that you don't even need to have an NGO. I mean, a single citizen can signal to the Commission that the law is being broken and the Commission will at least look at it. Um, so that's something that um, uh, you know is fairly unique. You mm -hmm. don't have it in most uh, European countries mm -hmm. uh, when you look at it. Um, and the other element of it is um, that uh, the Commission takes the initiative. So it doesn't cost you money, you don't have to pay a fee to the Commission, you don't take a liability, mm -hmm. nobody can sue you because you've talked to the Commission, mm -hmm. um, and so on. And then I would want really to reinforce uh, the issue of how, I would dare say, almost repressive <laughs> UK legislation is. Uh, I'm personally rather dismayed by how far it has gone, considering that the UK has invented civil society, free speech, freedom of association. Uh, it was the country where, back in the days, you know, any communist and anarchist could go to the home of capitalism and say that this is all nonsense and, uh, and still operate freely, kind of, on a good day. Um, we are now in a situation, for example, this legislation uh, that prevents you from saying pretty much anything about anything before elections uh, is something that doesn't exist in any other European country I'm aware of and, um, and is highly questionable on a kind of democratic uh, grounds from my point of view because, I mean, surely the point of civil society is to influence elections in a sense, not to tell people to vote for this party or for that party, but if I think that the environment needs to be protected, or if I think that human rights need to be protected, then challenging politicians and saying, well, your proposal is good and your proposal doesn't, that's exactly the democratic service that makes democracy meaningful. So um, I think uh, we, we need to look a little bit behind, beyond this kind of 
slightly complacent uh, view that I think a lot of people in the UK have of the UK as a global environmental leader, mm -hmm. a shining example of democracy, a place where civil society is better than anywhere else and so on. It sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not at all. I mean, the UK is a complex, messy, contradictory country like every other. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. It's also, I mean, it's not all this Empire 2.0 and all of that, or Kanzak. Uh, it has a very narrow perspective of the Commonwealth, which happens to be countries with white people in it. I mean, you don't speak of having exchange program with India, okay? Um, there's lots of great universities in India. Lots of problems right now with universities in India, but still, you know, don't speak of that, right? Um, so it's, it is quite problematic, and we can see, I mean, there's actually not that much interest in Canada or in Australia or in New Zealand with having these kind of exchanges. Um, and even with a trade deal, I mean, why would you want to have a trade deal with the UK compared to having a trade deal with the EU? I mean, of course, you want ideally both, but the UK is tiny compared to the EU anyway, so in terms of priority. Uh, but I think, I mean, in, for Erasmus, we're seeing, I mean, it was, the, the official posi position is that, I mean, no amendments was passed anyway because the Conservatives can just control everything now. Um, and the government is still trying to negotiate something, like if it's in the interest of the government. The problem is that Erasmus means it is actually it allows students from poorer background to travel and to study abroad. Students who can afford to go on a gap year to the U.S. You know, it's not your poor student. Um, so I think that's that's where that's where the issue is, and that's where I think there's lots, been lots of pushback against the vote in the Commons, with people saying, you know, I would never have been able to go without not just that exchange and the fact that I don't have to pay, pay fees, but the fact that I get an Erasmus grant as well. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, Erasmus is not only about the education, just the youth yes, part of Erasmus. Mm -hmm. So even a person that is 18 years old or 17, not studying, just has to work because there's no conditions, has to work with family, he or she will have a grant to go for a week abroad. That can change his life. Yeah, and I mean, from from a research side as well, there's lots of things for, you know, going in and teaching in another university as well, and like, there's you know, things. For, there's there's certainly uh, so on the yeah, I think that the dreams of empire, I I, I would agree that uh, there's a lot of delusion there, also because I mean there is another fairly plausible candidate for leading the Anglophone world. It's a fairly big, rich, powerful, English-speaking country, and it sits in, in North America, <laughs> <laughs> just about south of it. So, um, uh, so I think, you know, that's about harking back to a world that doesn't uh, e exist anymore. And by the way, I think we've seen that it also gets fairly negative receptions because uh, the memories of the empire uh, are not as warm and fuzzy in other parts of the Commonwealth. So, um, yeah, I have my serious doubt about that. But uh, touching on the Erasmus issue, there is a whole bunch of other things that risk being lost aside from the level play field legislation and so on, which is the big one. Um, so just to quote another uh, one that is very small in terms of money but hugely influential uh, is uh, LIFE, the, the LIFE uh, funding, uh, which is 0.3% of the EU budget, so it's kind of vanishingly small, but there's a whole bunch of species that would have gone extinct by now if it wasn't for uh, LIFE funding. and. Our organizations have been uh, working with it uh, a lot, and life has been one of the things that have been uh, gluing together the conservation community in Europe, because very often life uh, uh, projects are multi-country, and there is a whole kind of machine for um, 
passing best practice and one of the things that really in the last 30 years has taken us from a situation where people reinvent the wheel and spend 10 years failing something that someone else has already failed a decade before and so on to a situation where we have a pan-European conservation community that is working together with expertise that are being shared walking together across the range of species, uh, across the mi migratory uh, lines of species, and increasingly through life projects we are now walking uh, even beyond the EU. So we work on the conservation of uh, Egyptian vultures all the way from Bulgaria to Sudan, uh, exchanging with experts from Spain and Israel and so on that pitch in. Um, if the uh, UK pulls out of it, um, uh, you are isolating the UK conservation community from all this machinery uh, in a situation where UK nature will remain in Europe. It won't become part of the Commonwealth nature. <laughs> you know. um, and in a situation where the UK has some of the best expertise on the continent. So there would be, I would argue, a huge loss both to the EU and to the UK and beyond if that starts uh, breaking down. Again, if the Brexit negotiation end up in uh, a space of close relationship, there is no reason why the UK wouldn't be able to opt in to things like life, pay their way in and so on. But if we are going down this more ideologically driven rift, we are uh, nothing to do with, the, with them anymore, then there will be a price to pay. Uh, Horizon 2020 is another one mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of uh, investments in research um, and on and on it goes. I mean, the, 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 the EU has a whole yeah. series of bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. uh, some are more useful than others, but some of them are extremely useful. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, I mean, from a Northern Ireland, Ireland perspective, there's been lots of push to have a peace funding, like specific peace funding for Northern Ireland, even after Brexit. But all the life funding, all the other fundings are potentially going. And they also have a big impact in terms of, you know, making it a nice place to live and so perhaps a place where you have less conflict. Um, and definitely in Northern Ireland, NGOs in Northern Ireland have been really critical in writing life bids with their colleagues. In Ireland, that tends to be even less like even more understaffed and all that. So that's definitely going to have a knock-on negative impact on the environment on the whole island of Ireland. Mm -hmm. Should we, I think that's yeah. Okay. Um, I hope this was uh, interesting. Certainly was was for me. Um, I suspect that this debate will rumble on for uh, for for a while. As long um, as Brexit. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and by the way, one of the many kind of lies around Brexit uh, is that it will be over mm -hmm. at the end of this month, or even that it will be over at the end of this year. Forever. Uh, yeah, realistic. <laughs> realistically, uh, the kind of you know. Um, the politics between the UK and the rest of the EU uh, will go on for a very long time. They will be different, but um, but uh, yeah, I mean, geography doesn't disappear because you vote it to vote to make it go away. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, have a lovely evening, and um, to be continued. Mm -hmm. Thank you.